Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing. Projects discussed in the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. Good morning and welcome back to Punkcast. Today we've got Punk6597. He's a three Addy, wearing horn rim glasses, handlebar moustache and an iconic purple cap. <laughs> He's a builder at heart and previously worked at Jib Jab, Consensus, Nifty, Meme, and now currently the founder of Venture Punk, an innovation studio dedicated to advancing infrastructure in Web3, and also Skylab, a community for Web3 founders and funders. Please welcome the one and only and one of the most respected punks in this space, Mr. Jordan Lyle. Jordan, welcome, mate. Hey, Maxwell. Thanks so much for having me. appreciate the intro there. Of course. Of course, man. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for taking some time out in the evening to, uh, to join us on the call, but... Um, Really excited to uh, unwrap your punk story, man. <laughs> um, so, so I, um, I actually remember meme um, in the middle of, or maybe it's towards the back end of DeFi summer, um, where I think you sent out a tweet and that just went absolutely viral, and that caught, <laughs> that caught, uh, that caught, that caught fire. There. Maybe if we could just start off with uh, just uh, just that story because I think that was a really cool story. How did it, how did that kick off? Yeah, it was it was kind of a crazy story. You know, I, I at the time I was I was working at Consensus, building some DeFi products, really thinking about how do, how do we analyze risk across DeFi, uh, and I, I, I tweeted kind of this fake product mock up one day. It was like a Friday night. And uh, it was, you know, middle of DeFi summer 2020, just over, you know, two years ago. And it was just kind of a commentary on the YOLO nature of some developers in DeFi. Uh, funny thing is, it, it took off and like the community just, just loved it and retweeted it and ran with it. Um, and being the, you know, uh, entrepreneurial guy like I am, I, I said, you know, we've, we've got to do something here. There's enough interest in this fake product. We got to, we got to form a community and potentially build this product. So I launched it, you know, as, as you do, you, you launch a telegram group and dozens and dozens of people in on the joke turned into hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands. And, uh, had this community on our hands that really, you know, it started as, as like fans of this tweet, but it turned into friends and friends of friends. Uh, and the community decided to, to launch a token. Um, we called it the meme token, had nothing to do with like that original tweet. That was just kind of the spark that created this, this community, but the community took off and issued a token, did an airdrop, um, kind of a fair airdrop to, Part, early participants of, of this community and um, and like the meme community, the meme token was live and it was just a couple hours after this tweet, the token was listed on CoinGecko and there were, there was liquidity on Uniswap and it just kind of took off and, you know, being, you know, I was doxxed completely, you know, my, my face was on this thing. I had a pretty good gig at consensus and I didn't want this kind of, spiraling out of control. So I, I told people not to buy it. I said, don't buy meme. And that, that became the <laughs> meme in itself and registered immediately that just kind of, you know, uh, made me go by don't, don't buy meme.com. I went and bought the domain and, and it was like, okay, well, is it a shit coin or what are we doing? Is it like Doge? It's like Doge for DeFi. Like, what is this thing? We decided to, you know, a group of us in the early days decided to actually go build a product um, and we, you know, we, we thought like, what's, what's meme worthy these days? Well, this was as mentioned in the middle of DeFi summer. So, you know, staking, uh, was really interesting liquidity farming. Um, but there's this thing called NFTs that were just getting interesting again. Again, this is middle of 2020 kind of pre 
pre um, Top Shots, pre pre obviously PFPs, um, but it was just interesting enough that we're like, well, what if we what if we combine NFTs with yield farming? So we we kind of launched the first implementation of uh, you know staking for NFTs, and it turned into this huge thing, and and the the token. At, at its peak, got to the top 100 tokens of CoinGecko. It was quite quite a crazy journey, quite a fun, you know, rewarding time. Um, a lot has kind of, it was definitely an impact on my life and um, kind of drove me deeper into the NFT community. But yeah, it was such a crazy, wild ride those those days two years ago. We were so, so young and naive back then. <laughs> Man, I... Um... It, it was fun for me too, just to, you know, I, I was sort of sitting and watching. I didn't get in early, but I got in a little bit later. Um, so I think I, I, I got in at a couple hundred bucks, maybe three, four hundred bucks or something. And I think at one point it hit like 1500, right? 1500 bucks or something. It was absolute yeah. insanity. It was, it was and, pretty uh, insane. It was multiples of ETH at the time, which was just insane. It was crazy. And, uh, and some of the artists you managed to get on early, I mean, um, were, were pretty notable right so i think you had like ferocious and I, I mean i picked up a couple of those ferocious pieces uh early on and then i think at one stage you you had people on the, on the track but i don't think you sort of fell through <laughs> that right kind of there are many chapters to the the book of lore for meme and uh, the one that stands out for most people is the time we almost had people on our on our platform yeah when before people had, had done his big drop on um nifty gateway you know, where he, where he, he minted his everydays, right? There was one more recent everyday that, that people did with a, with a pineapple as, as the art. Um, it was, um, it was SpongeBob's house under the sea or something like that. That's right. Uh, that was our, that was our logo. The pineapple was our logo. Um, there are reasons why, but it's all silliness, but, uh, everyone assumed when, when people dropped that, pineapple nft or when he when he put pineapple art on his instagram which was all he was doing back then before nfts right when people saw that they assumed it was for meme so the, the price just instantly you know pumped um he caught attention to that and he said okay i'm going to be releasing this pretty soon on nifty gateway as part of my everyday collection i'll make you a deal if this pineapple nft ends up selling for 69 eth i promise I will do a drop on meme. So <laughs> there, I thought, you know, no way this is going to happen. This, you know, what are the, what are the chances? Again, this was, this was like end of 2020 before really st things started to take off the thought of, you know, one piece of this collection going for 69 ETH, probably hundred K USD at the time was just insane, but it did. It ended up going for like a hundred ETH. Um, and and people initially, you know, um, stood by that, and he tweeted that, and uh, had a big impact on the price itself and the community. And we were internally, and in, you know, within the community, we were celebrating that people was coming. Uh, and over the preceding months, you know, worked with people on what this drop would look like. And then he did his uh, the Christie's drop for sixty nine million dollars or whatever that was, if you remember it back then. <laughs> and his his whole you know mission and and his whole you know position in life certainly certainly changed. And it didn't make a lot of sense for him and his team to drop on this silly little uh, project. Uh, and as much as we tried to work that out. We got lawyers involved in everything. It just didn't end up working out. Uh, so that was kind of, you know, bittersweet for a moment there. We were in the same circle as people, but uh, it didn't end up work, working out. I think the meme was probably more fun for the community of, of like, we have them, then we don't have them. And uh, it, it's another chapter in the crazy story. But yeah, to your point, I mean, other amazing artists such as Fawocious, um, Jonathan Wolf. Uh, there's a number of really cool artists that kind of took took the risk and took the chance of this silly little community, uh, you know, DeFi staking project thing, and some that have kind of come on or went on to become, you know, really 
top artists in this space. So it's, it was really exciting as a way to, as a way to get to know some of these artists and discover more talent and, you know, become friends with a lot of these artists. It was, it was super fun. Yeah, that was, uh, that was super fun. Um, and the community vibes back then were, were, were pretty cool too. I remember <laughs> just hanging out in the, uh, in the telegram at the time and, um, just catching up with a few people. And I think people were coming up with different strategies in terms of how to get into that first block. Right. Cause I think, um, you had to stake your meme, and I think if you were the first to sort of unlock, then you'd get first opportunity to to mint at that time. And so people were like trying to figure out strategies for that, which is kind of fun. Um, but so, so just out of curiosity as well, is like is the community still around, or are they still hang out, and or is that sort of disbanded now? There, there's still a community. Um, it's it's still active. There's still a heartbeat. Uh, still a bunch of really great people in there. Um, there have been several kind of attempts to restart or, or, or at least maybe kind of fork some of the vibes, fork the community a little bit. Um, a couple of projects re that have recently launched just to try to bring back some of that magic. I, uh, I, I feel like it's something that needs to continue. So I think, you know, I'm in support of anything that tries to bring back that, that magic, bring back that fun. Um, because it was pretty impactful in this, in this whole ecosystem, I think. And it brought a lot of people into NFTs, you know, um, had, had so many people tell me that they were big DeFi guys and they never really got into NFTs until meme and vice versa. People in the NFT space that really discovered DeFi and, and Uniswap and how to stake, stake LP. Um, so I, th I think it was a, you know, a real catalyst in terms of bringing in lots of people into this space. Absolutely. Well, um, hopefully there's a don't buy meme phase two, man. It uh, was super fun. And um, wait, so, so, so maybe uh, take us back a, a little bit then, um, you know, what was your sort of background and, you know, upbringing to, to everything that happened before if meme? Yeah, well, my background is kind of has always been at the intersection of like tech and business and design. Um, serial, I, I call myself a serial entrepreneur. I'm a product guy. Uh, before crypto, you know, I had launched a Web2 company that was acquired. We were a mobile app company. It was acquired by JibJab, kind of an early internet media company. Um, so my background's always kind of been around consumer products and mobile apps. Uh, after you know rounding out my time after the acquisition at jib jab spent spent four years there and this was right in time this was 2017 just as things were kind of popping off getting exciting for bitcoin and ethereum and there's this you know i i, I was around bitcoin since 2013. i was actually building some products around other blockchains like stellar and uh ripple just building some fun prototypes and and things like that but it really, you know, when, when I saw Ethereum, it really stood out. It was like, wow, as a product guy, I can build some really fun stuff with this. It's, it's, it's no longer just about sending, sending money to your friends. Uh, it, we can actually build something here. We can build products. We could kind of start to reinvent banking. We can build games. We can do all sorts of things. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just, just jumped in early 2018 jumped in all in full time working in this in this space working in crypto and particularly the ethereum ecosystem i went went to work for a uh, early crypto startup called total they were a dex aggregator uh, a couple years there was recruited by consensus just as we were calling it defi uh, I, I joined as like a defi product lead uh, the team within consensus launched several products in defi at while while at consensus, as mentioned, launched meme and that that kind of sent me into the NFT space um, full time. You know, I dove in head first into the NFT scene and uh, decided to make that my my thing. Uh, so I left consensus, kind of handed off the meme project to the community, and then went and helped start nifties.com, which was more of a uh, in partnership with some big movie studios, we launched several like uh, entertainment commercial properties, uh, NFT communities. 
and um, a few months ago left that to start Venture Punk. So it's been, you know, uh, full time about four and a half years, going on five years now that I've been full time in this space. And um, so that's that's my story. Wow, that's a that's a that's a lot of things um, <laughs> in a short space of time. But I think uh, four or five years in crypto is like probably amplified, right? So, um, man, there's um, there's a few things I want to unpack there. Um, Maybe the first thing is, I think you said you started working on a few things with Stellar and uh, EOS um, and then found your way into Ethereum. Uh, I guess maybe if you can unpack that a little bit more, what was it about Ethereum that um, you found a bit more compelling for you to spend more time in? Yeah, you know, I, I was a fan of, of Bitcoin. I kind of saw it as this opportunity here to kind of, uh, going to re reinvent money, um, and kind of saw it as an opportunity, um, for just upside. I saw it more as an investment. Uh, but then I started seeing more blockchains come out like stellar. Stellar was really interesting because they had like an eye for design and UX in the early days, um, where Bitcoin was a little bit more, well, obviously, you know, decentralized, um, it really stood out to me and Stellar had just launched and um, they were in need of some developers to start building on the Stellar blockchain. Right place at right time. You know, I was waiting for my company to be sold in, in 2014 and, um, you know, waiting through all the legal back and forth, right. Uh, had, had some free time on my hands. So I started building out these simple prototypes Really, I'm not a developer and more of a product guy, but I know enough uh, code to like build a prototype to be to be dangerous, as they say. So basically, it's really just mashing up APIs. So I built this little silly, silly little prototype of like using SMS, you can check the price of Stellar. Um, that was before we called them Lumens at the time. They're not called Lumens, but uh, or you could check your wallet balance. Um, I started building out simple like little apps like that um and for a sh short period of time like i became one of the the even even as simple as that was one of the early you know developers on that blockchain i was on the website for a while i talked to the founders they started sending me clients um so i, I kind of knew that that there's an opportunity here to start building on blockchains. It was right when I sold my my company and we needed to kind of focus on the company we had just sold to Jib Jab. Uh, so I ended up kind of putting putting that work on hold uh, and focusing on you know the the company we just sold. But that was kind of my first taste of building a blockchain. Um, I I had done at the time I had done a little bit of like we you know altcoin trading, uh, but got totally wrecked. Like at the time lost. You know, for me, that was a lot, but thousands and thousands of dollars got, got wrecked. So uh, mentally, I kind of put put the blockchain and, and crypto on hold for a bit. Um, and then it wasn't until 2016, 2017, where um, it's, it's quite funny. In, in 2017, the Dodgers went to the World Series and it wasn't in the budget for me to get tickets. But I all of a sudden it hit me that well, I have this asset that's now worth a lot more money uh, than it was when I bought it called Bitcoin. Um, and maybe I can sell a piece of it to afford Dodger tickets. So I ended up selling half of Bitcoin, bought two tickets for my son and I to the World Series, had a great time. Um, but that, that was kind of an opportunity of like, wow, this this Bitcoin went up a lot in value. What is, what's the latest with Bitcoin? What's going on in this space? What's going on in this world? Uh, by that time, you know, Ethereum was now supported on, on Coinbase. I thought it was just another alt, altcoin, but I, it was an opportunity for me to kind of dig in and kind of get caught up. Realize that Ethereum is not just, you know, not just another altcoin. It's actually a whole ecosystem. It's the world computer. It's, you know, all, all the all the memes that we call Ethereum. But there was something there was something different. As mentioned, you know, it's more than just sending money back and forth. Uh, we, we using smart contracts, we can build something sophisticated. Uh, and that's 
that's kind of what, what got me to pay, pay more attention and kind of get into the community. And I was, I was going to local, local Ethereum meetups in LA. And um, there was something different about that, about that ecosystem, about the community, just the vibes were different. It was more about building and less about, um, you know, flipping or less about trying to grab every bit of ROI. And it was more about building community building and, and, and product building. So yeah, I, I've been in Ethereum ever since. Amazing. <laughs> and then, um, and then so maybe talk to us about consensus. Like, um, I, I guess maybe just to share with everybody, what is consensus? And I think you mentioned you were working on a few um, DeFi projects at consensus. Uh, maybe you can just delve into that and share your experience. Yeah. So for those that don't know, consensus is, is kind of a pillar in the Ethereum community. I, um, you know, it was, it was founded by Joe Lubin, who was a co-founder of Ethereum itself. Um, it's responsible for a lot of the, the products and infrastructure that, um, people are using today in the Ethereum world. Like it, it, it started investing and building into infrastructure and support and s providing services for others, for other businesses, for governments in and around the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, so it, you know, it launched MetaMask, it launched Infura, uh, it, it, it now, you know, oversees Truffle, like a ton of these infrastructure things that if you're a developer, or even if you're a user, like you can't go a minute in the Ethereum ecosystem without using some of these products. It was a bit, it was a big, big team. Um, for me at the time, like it kind of felt like I was getting to go work for Google or Microsoft in the early days, right. Where it was like this, this group is doing a bunch of really cool stuff and this is early and I want to be in and on the early stage. Um, I, I joined in 2019 and the company had been around for a few years. So it's not like I was the, you know, the early employee, but I was kind of joining at the time where they hadn't like, little to no DeFi presence, right? Uh, we had just started calling it DeFi before then, like DEXs were the cool cool thing. Um, Compound had launched. DeFi at the time was really just, uh, you know, lending lending your stable coins or lending your, your ETH, uh, creating CDPs on Maker. Um, so I saw this as an opportunity to like, have the backing of a really big company filled with lots of smart people and have the ability to kind of be our own little startup. And uh, we ended up launching several products and communities in, in the world of DeFi during my time at Consensus. Um, at the time of, of me, the meme tweet, as I mentioned, I was thinking a lot around DeFi risk. That, that was because my team and I at Consensus, we, we launched the DeFi score, which was Kind of a, a formula or a or a um, system of identifying risk across DeFi. Uh, you know, at, at the time, DeFi was you know stake your tokens, or we didn't even say that. You know, deposit your tokens and earn uh, an ROI. Um, different platforms had different returns to different APYs. So, as a new user coming into the space, how do you think about risk? Do you just find the highest APY, uh, no, because some are more risky than others. Uh, so we really started to break down and kind of create a score for each of these projects. Okay, were they fully decentralized? Okay, uh, did they have their smart contracts um, audited? Did they have a bug bounty program? Uh, a bug bounty program? Uh, you know, what was the volume of, of some of these DeFi protocols. So we really started to try to turn that into a science rather than just guessing or, or going after the highest rate of return. Um, try to put some risk, maybe like a, like a, like a rating system on the blockchain. Um, from that, we ended up building a couple products that utilized the, the rating scores. Um, we kind of built a community around that. And, uh, you know, those that, that know like the, the journey of, of consensus, this was also a time where they had some downsizing. So uh, there was, you know, over my two years there, uh, you know, there were a couple couple moments where they downsized. So we, we put the DeFi score project on hold and they 
we, we uh, then started working on some other projects. My team and I started working with Scale, S-K-A-L-E, on the launch of that network and the staking platform there. Um, towards the end of my time at Consensus, kind of post-meme, I was consulting on a couple projects in and around Consensus on NFTs. So I was kind of, uh, for a moment, helping the MetaMask team on like how to think about NFTs within within MetaMask. So it was great just to kind of, um, you know, start out as the DeFi guy and then I became the NFT guy within Consensus. And uh, now they're doing a lot of things within, of course, within DeFi and, and now with, with NFTs. So, and I've, bec- I've, I've stayed close and stayed friendly. Um, a lot of my friends in crypto uh, come from Consensus, my time there. It was a really awesome experience. Um, getting to work with just like the smartest people in this space. And uh, it was a super cool opportunity. Amazing. Man, that was, uh, that would have been so much, uh, so much fun back then as well, right? <laughs> I mean, DeFi Summer was such a, such a crazy period. I mean, those API, APYs that were uh, launching on some of those protocols were absolutely insane. Um, so just to be in the mix of that would have been really, really fun. And, and, and mate, so tell me about, I guess, you know, you, you by default with meme came the um, NFT expert and NFTs back then were were relatively nascent in terms of adoption. Talk, talk me through, I guess, your your entry into NFTs. What was your first NFT? When would when did you sort of get sold on on NFTs? And what was your, I guess, your thinking behind that at that time? So my very first NFT was CryptoKitties. I, uh, this is right as, as mentioned, right. Was I was, when I was kind of getting back into the blockchain and, uh, what trying to figure out what was going on and really found, you know, dove into crypto Twitter and started following certain people. And, and like all of a sudden one day, everyone was talking about these crypto kitties, these kitties on the blockchain that were slowing down the entire Ethereum network. And, uh, you know, I, I, I paid attention and, and I had to try it. So that was literally the first time I installed MetaMask was at the, at the you know, the day after the launch of CryptoKitties because I had to figure this thing out. And my mind was just spinning like another use case for blockchain, another use case for these smart contracts. We've now got uh, assets, digital assets that can be proven unique on the blockchain and it was another kind of like level up for the brain of like what's possible. And um, it was really exciting. So I, uh, so that was my first, you know, I, I purchased a couple crypto kitties. I was mating them, uh, breeding them, whatever, whatever they called it. <laughs> and that was just super fun. And I remember like all of a sudden there was an, a crypto kitty Gen Z NFT that sold for like $90,000. And this was, this again was just, It took the space by storm, a lot of opinions on if that was valid and people like that just blew my mind. It's funny looking back as we think about all the NFTs that have sold for much, much more since then. But um, it was a real spike in, in, uh, you know, in my attention, in, in like people's attention or people's interest in NFTs, but it, it, it kind of lit a spark that remained dormant for a couple of years. Like, to be honest, I checked out. OpenSea when it launched, I bought a couple NFTs around, you know, DevCon 2018. I, uh, I ended up launching, you know, creating some of my own NFTs in 2019 just to kind of play with the tech. Uh, but it wasn't really until meme until, you know, DeFi summer of 22 or sorry of 2020 where, uh, you know, I, I, it kind of caught me all the, progress, even though I have been spending so much time in DeFi, there have been people that stayed in NFTs, whether they're builders or, or creators or community people, and just and kind of kept the ball rolling. Um, it was at that point where I kind of jumped back in and uh, realized that there's no, there's something special about NFTs. It's not just kind of for silly cat pictures. It's, uh, it could be so much more you know, I, I, having been involved in a bunch of different, you know, communities and subcultures in crypto from, from, you know, Bitcoin to Stellar to, 
you know, DEXs to DeFi. It was really NFTs that um, caused me really to just like pause and think. And, you know, it was the NFT community, especially back then when, when money wasn't really the driving factor, uh, something special. And, and it's like using this tech in a creative way. And there's so many people that were there, not really just to make money, but to like use this tech. And there were reasons why people were using this tech and uh, getting to work with creators and getting to work with artists and the admiration for the art or for the tech uh, really meant something. It's not just about, you know, extending your ROI or whatever. Uh, so that was really the opportunity. Once I started building in NFTs with meme, that's kind of when I fell in love with the NFT community. Amazing. And um, mate, it's, it's interesting <clears throat> that you made the transition from, I guess, DeFi altcoins into, into NFTs. And I think there's still, for me, I sort of find that there are still very two distinct groups of people in crypto, um, absolutely different people. And I think there's still a fair bit of resistance from the crypto altcoin community that still probably don't accept NFTs as anything legitimate. Um, I mean, from your point of view, what, why, do, why do you think that is? Like, I'm just sort of always um, intrigued by that. Yeah, it's a great insight. I mean, it's totally true. You know, I, I've i tweeted about this or, or thought about this quite a bit ever since then. It's like um, there are people that are such big fans of Bitcoin that they that they, they, they kind of stand firm and, and they're unable to really look into Ethereum or, you know, anything else other than Bitcoin, these maxis. And then there are people that, you know, got into this space through Bitcoin, then discovered Ethereum and all that's all that's possible. And then saw this implementation called, you know, ERC 721s and kind of brushed that off. It's, it's funny where how some people's minds work and they're able to, you know, their brain takes them to, to a certain point, but not any further. For me, it was kind of silly that people were, were claiming, you know, people in crypto claiming that these NFTs had no value when um, the similar argument could be made, you know, from traditional finance about Bitcoin itself, right? Um, these things have value because we all believe it has value. Uh, we're, we're doing something here unique. There's a reason why you can't just, uh, you know, copy a Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it's easier to right click and save an, a, a photo attached, you know, an image attached to an NFT. But the, the inherent properties are pretty obvious once you've kind of gotten past the, you know, the hurdle of like digital money. Honestly, it's just I, I chalk it up to just like human nature and always wanting to be right and when, especially when your bags are full, you become maxis and you don't want to kind of think that there's something else there. So something I, you know, that, that's kind of driven me to like try to not be closed minded in this space. Um, that that's been good and bad. I've uh, you know, it's, it's been helpful as I, as I invest, as I collect, as I build. And um, also, you know, it, it can, you could be spinning your wheels trying to, trying something new that just doesn't make sense. But I think most of us in this space have, have this sort of, um, you know, affinity to trying new things and exploring new opportunities, opportuni opportunism, you might call it, uh, that it, that I, that I think that like most of us, thankfully most of us are able to kind of make that leap to the next kind of the next big thing. Awesome. And Jordan, so what, what are you, um, so you're working on uh, VenturePunk now. Can you maybe just give an introduction to Pen VenturePunk? Because um, I, I, I think we just spoke earlier. I um, was lucky enough to uh, participate as part of uh, Punk Dow, Punk Ventures, and uh, I know that we made a um, small investment in, in, in VenturePunk. So maybe if you can just introduce that and what you're sort of doing there. Yeah. So yeah, as mentioned, I just launched VenturePunk Inc. And it's a Web3 venture builder or a product studio. And yeah, we recently closed a pre-seed round uh, that included some amazing builders, some amazing DAOs, 
And, and as you mentioned, Punk Style or Punk's Ventures, we we're, were the first, uh, first money out of that, out of that group. Uh, really excited to have groups like yourselves. We're going to be making an announcement soon to kind of, um, you know, kick off the venture punk mm-hmm. brand and, and community and announce the raise and all the, all the investors here soon, but uh, I'm excited. So, so, you know, venture builder product studio, what does that mean? I, it, it, it's really a opportunity for us to try building new things and taking a bunch of shots on goal. Uh, so we'll, we'll soon, you know, I just mentioned, we just, we just recently closed the round. We're building out the team. We'll soon start launching experiments or little projects or MVPs or prototypes in, in web three. So that can range from NFT projects and protocols to DeFi tooling, uh, you know, various community initiatives, education programs. It's really our chance to, um, you know, take several shots on goal in this space. And, uh, you know, given my background in launching products and projects and teams and communities, um, it really kind of, you know, gives me the opportunity to kind of, uh, create this little ecosystem and think really kind of think like what, what does a venture studio look like when it was, you know, built natively for web three? Uh, well, we, we build alongside the community, you know, we build in public, we, we build up a base of users that become beta testers for everything we launch or early, you know, early adopters, beta users for the things that we launch, provide a sense of like a, a stake or ownership into the things we launch for the community. And uh, yeah, so we're right, right now kind of in the, in the thick of it of getting kind of aligning our strategies here around content and community and our product roadmap. So in the coming weeks and months, we'll start, we'll start shipping. I, I, I'm, I'm really excited because, you know, as someone who's built a lot of things, this is really the opportunity to um, have options to really follow this space, to try a bunch of things out, um, to, to, to ship early and often. And, and, and I think we'll, by doing that, we'll be really like valuable, helpful, uh, impactful for like the future infrastructure of what gets built over the next few years. So, I, I'm 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 really excited about that. Amazing! I'm uh, I'm super excited too. I think there's just so much opportunity uh, in the space right now, um, especially in this bear market, to uh, to pick up some uh, some pearls. Um, and more importantly, I think I'm uh, probably even more proud that uh, you're, you're a punk at heart, <laughs> um, leading the charge here. And so, so maybe if you could um, tell us about your punk journey, like how did you find out about punks, and you know when did you buy your first punk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, as we just talked about, my first NFT was CryptoKitties. As, as most of us know, uh, CryptoPunks predate CryptoKitties. And, uh, you know, before this this ERC-721 standard. So, you know, kind of doing a deep dive on my return back to crypto and, and Ethereum. Like, I was aware of, of CryptoPunks. I kind of knew they existed. They kept popping up every every time I would try to learn more and more about this space. Um, I was at a conference. It, it, I think it was Consensus 2018 in New York, where they had the founders. I think it was the founders of Larva Labs on stage, you know, talking about the significance and, and how interesting it was. Not even then did it occur to me that I should probably go check some of these things out or 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 there's a difference between learning about something than actually, you know, taking the leap to actually acquire them. Um, so I had an opportunity a couple times and it never really, it never really happened, but, uh, early 21, so early, uh, 2021, probably around January, February, it is when I, uh, you know, we started talking about building nifties and I kind of, you know, made it made it my own kind of personal mission to uh, be a builder in this space and be be you know the NFT guy. And at some point, you know, it just hit me that like, can I call myself the NFT guy if I don't own like the the very first you know um, at least you know if, if within the Ethereum community the the the, the understood like uh, classic Godfather of NFTs the the CryptoPunks. 
so I, at that point I decided to put my money where my mouth is, you know, and um, I, I was still kind of deep, deep into it that like uh, I, I felt like I kind of had to do it. Um, I also kind of convinced myself at the time that by, by buying punk, this is kind of diversifying my, my portfolio. I had a friend ask like, you know, did you talk to your wife after you spent so much money on, on, on a crypto punk? <laughs> and it didn't even occur to me because, you know, it, it was Ethereum. I paid in Ethereum. It's not like I had to write a check or something. Um, but yeah, so I think I paid around 20 ETH at the time. ETH was maybe a thousand dollars. Um, and, you know, I, I had first picked up the crypto punk and I picked up something off the floor, like the cheapest one. And, but it, but it didn't really, it wasn't me, you know, it didn't, it didn't settle. Uh, I didn't feel like putting it as my Twitter avatar. And I guess that's the, that, that's the thing. Um, so I sold it, bought another one, didn't like it, sold it, bought another one. And, and, you know, went up, decided to go up a little bit higher from the floor. And I saw these with, with punks and I saw like a real, or sorry, with, with the hats, the purple, purple caps. And I saw that, I saw that a few were being picked up. Turns out it was, um, at the time it was, uh, Flamingo Dow, just like sweeping the purple hat floor. And, um, that gave me some FOMO and, and I really wanted a purple hat. So I went and, and, and picked one up, um, to me, it was like, once I had that guy, I was like, kind of looks like me. It, it instantly became my identity on, on social media, specifically Twitter. Uh, and it was like, and, and ever since I've been using that as my digital identity. And um, it's funny that just like how physically I start looking more and more like my crypto punk. You know, I bought a purple <laughs> hat. I... Uh, I usually wear glasses. Um, there, there's been a time where I've had the handlebar mustache. So it is funny how my uh, my human self is uh, starting to come closer and closer to uh, my my digital identity. Amazing, mate. So, and so Flamingo were have got a bag of purple hats, do they? I didn't I didn't know that. You got a bags and bags full of of everything, but yeah, I know they hold they hold quite a bit of punks. Yeah. No, it's a super cool punk, and um, it, it actually actually does look like you. Uh, so I think that's probably a compliment. I mean, so so um, I'm, I'm, I've got your OpenSea Jordan Lyle Vault open. You've got a really, I'd probably say, a Grail collection, right? Like hmm. um, Denzers, Chromies, um, Moonbirds. I mean, like, uh, I mean, what, what what kind of things do you enjoy collecting, and and you know, why do you collect? I, uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned some of the ones that some of the, the things that I just, um, that are kind of the grails in my collection, the Fidenzas, the Chromie squiggles. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of art blocks and, and generative art in general. I think the thing, the thing that stands out for me are, are, are the projects and collections and artists that are doing something different that kind of push the envelope a little bit of all the space try, uh, try new things. Um, I, you know, I was early to art blocks and I minted a couple squiggles and a couple other projects. Uh, but again, just because I like to try everything, you know, being a builder in the space, you want to try all the competition. You want to kind of know what's being built. Um, I didn't go all in and I ended up, you know, paying the difference in a, on a Fidenza, uh, paying, you know, a few, a few months later. Um, but is those types of projects that just kind of stand out to me. Those they're, they're historical. They're they're doing something different. They're doing something unique. They're visually kind of stunning. Um, I in terms of PFP projects, like I, uh, you know, I was early to buy Board Apes. I, uh, you know, I minted Proof Pass. So I was able to get a bunch of Moonbirds. I'm also a big fan of CCO collections just because, you know, CCO really stood out to me as like the next step and like, okay, so we have decentralized tech. Uh, now we have decentralized, you know, uh, rights in a sense uh, where the community owns it. And uh, so a project like 
nouns and little nouns and cryptodes and projects like that. I'm also a, a member of the Coco DAO, which is the a DAO kind of in, in the CC0 space. Um, so yeah, I mean, looking through my my uh, collection, you'll probably see a bunch of different things from uh, you know gen art to membership passes to PFPs to CCO to one of ones. I uh, I don't have a ton of one of ones. I, I um, but there are several artists that just kind of stand out to me. Like, and and I think it's because I like kind of become friends with them first, and then I decide to kind of go like buy a collection or buy a one of one piece to add to my collection. So I've got one of ones from Brian Brinkman, Amber Vittoria, Jonathan Wolf, um, groups like, you know, artists like that. Um, I think kind of what drives me is just like, you know, my, my NFT collection strategy is similar to my crypto or, or token investment strategy, which is more like buy and hold. I've never been a good day trader. I've never been a flipper. Uh, you know, I've had some wins, but they all kind of come from buying something that's like super interesting and that where I'm convicted and holding for a long time. Um, that's kind of worked out for me in the past. And I, I recently had to sell a few things just to kind of, uh, you know, balance out and, and kind of diversify and get liquid. Um, Fortunately, I'm able to hold on to a lot of these, you know, grails, but it is an opportunity to kind of reset and rethink, you know, um, I hold all these things. Am I really, do I participate in the community? Do I see this thing? You know, do I see myself holding, even if it goes to zero, you know, with this, with this current market over the last year or so, you know, it's really given an opportunity to kind of rethink what is, what am I holding on to and why? Um, so that's why you'll see things like, those projects that we mentioned, you know, continue to, uh, you know, I'll continue to hold on to those for a while. Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of us have had to reassess our bags in the, in the bear market, right? I think yeah. in the bull market, you were just accumulating as much as you could. And, uh, I like to say to people that I had to Marie Kondo my, uh, my bags <laughs> and go through each one and sort of test if, um, you know, was it actually sparking any joy? And if not, I probably yeah. have to find an exit. Cool. When you're looking to, I guess, the, um, the punk community, um, is there a sort of favorite punk identity or profile that, um, that you've got a lot of value out of over, over the years? Like who's your favorite? You mean like, like, like an individual person in the community? Yeah. Ah, so many. I, um, I really like G money and what he's doing and in, in all of his projects and kind of, uh, you know, how he's pushing this whole space forward. Um, I've, I've got a handful of, of punks, you know, on my cap table. So I have, I have lots of friends not to single anybody out, but I really like Sergito and, um, yeah, there's a bunch of, bunch of people that are active in the community that I've, you know, become close to, um, Henry, uh, thank you, X. Um, you know, I, I think there are several people that just kind of, kind of confirm what this community is about. And um, it, I, I just got back from Bogota for uh, for DevCon last week, and we had a we had a CryptoPunk meetup, and um, it was the last meetup that I had attended since NFT NYC. Um, and it just kind of kind of affirms like this is this is the community that that I belong in. It's it's one of the you know the, the Telegram group of uh, punk holders is one of the communities I check you know religiously every morning. You know when I open up the computer, I, I, I jump into the Telegram. There's only a couple communities where I do that, and 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 one of them is the crypto punk community, just because. You know, I just think it embodies so much. And whenever you meet a punk in real life, there's like an instant shorthand where you know that this person is in it for the right reasons. Uh, there's a reason we're choosing this community versus apes or some other community. And uh, you, you kind of get this instant kind of uh, relationship or kinship or, you know, trust with this person. Many, many of us in this community are builders ourselves. Um, 
so it's yeah it's such a such a valuable community to be a part of that's why i like i'm excited for venture punk obviously with with a punk in the name we're we're kind of de facto part of this larger ecosystem i'm excited to uh you know get get so many individual punk angel investors on my cap table take money from punk ventures and really kind of further uh you know develop the crypto punk ecosystem and and brand amazing and uh yeah excited to excited to see you kick some goals for us too mate um mm -hmm. you, you, you've got some heavy 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 bags on your shoulders now um <laughs> pressure's on pressure's on and um mate if you were to describe punk culture in a few words and i know you you highlighted a few of those things earlier on but i mean how would you summarize i guess punk culture for you I, the word that comes to mind is like trust or, or trustworthy. I, I think, you know, obviously there, there are bad actors in any community. And I know we like to make jokes about people who, you know, old rich white guys that buy a punk and then, and then kind of, uh, you know, uh, do things that aren't great for the community. But um, on the whole, I, I think, you know, that this community is just is just something special. Uh, the reason I say trust is because you've you've got this kind of instant connection. Whether whether they you know were early to acquire a punk uh, and they they kind of saw the potential, or uh, they came later. Like some of my closest friends in this space are people that you know have have a crypto punk and. Uh, when, when I think about, okay, what's the brand that I'm trying to create with venture punk? Um, you know, there's a reason why I'm kind of leaning into the venture punk and right, leaning into the, the crypto punk community because it's, it's like instant, um, validation or instant, uh, cache built just by aligning yourselves with a community such as the crypto punks. Awesome. And then uh, if you could pass on a message, I guess, to the owner of your next punk, what would you like to say to them? The owner of my next punk or the... Oh, your current punk, your current punk. The next owner of my current punk. Just the thought of selling is upsetting. Um, so I guess I wouldn't sell. It would be to my son. So I would say, hi, hi, son. <laughs> um, <laughs> take, take good care of it. I it's so attached to me personally that it would, it would be really weird, like seeing somebody else run with that identity online, uh, unless they were related to me somehow. Um, so I see it as something I pass on to my kids and grandkids. Awesome. And Jordan, um, I guess any final closing comments on your side? Um, this has been super fun. No, I just appreciate all you're doing. And, you know, speaking of like evolving the community and providing support and, um, you know, a place for punk culture. I mean, I just kudos to you and everything that you're doing Maxwell to like further this space and the, the punk vibes. So this was super awesome to be a part of. And, and one, one, you know, one of your early episodes, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, honored just to be, just to be here, but really appreciate it. Man. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan. And, um, and I guess how, how can, <clears throat> how can people find you? What's the best way to connect with you and find out a little bit more about you? Yeah, I'd say go on Twitter search for Jordan Lyle, um, Jordan L Y A L L on Twitter, or they can check out venturepunk.com. Awesome. And I'll put those in the show notes, but, um, but yeah, so, so Jordan, uh, this was super fun and, and super grateful that uh, you joined and thank you for your words. And um, yeah, hopefully we can, we can do this again uh, or get an update in, in, in mm. uh, a few months. But, um, but yeah, look forward to catching up again soon. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. And that's, a, that's another wrap for podcast for this week. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll catch you again next week. Bye now.